We all know no one likes to pay taxes. For many people, though, understanding the tax return can be really confusing, especially when it comes to identifying potential deductions that can save people money. You know, additionally, the concept of pass-through entities can be really difficult to grasp. And that's why in this live show, we're going to break down the complexities of a tax return and make it easy for you to understand, but also help you understand pass-through entities in a way that is manageable. So here's what we're going to cover. In a nutshell, we're going to cover a sample tax return. We're going to break it down in different areas that you should be familiar with and understand. Sonia and I will add some color around this and give you some ideas as to where your income is coming from and some ideas on how to save money, really. We will cover how profits from a business flow through to your personal tax return. And then we will also cover some common missed opportunities so you can save money in the future. Welcome, Rosie. You're welcome. If you have any questions, feel free to leave things on the chat. Put your questions in the chat. We're about to begin here pretty soon. Welcome back to another episode of the Green Cards to Greenbacks podcast. This is a live show today, and I'm very, very excited. For many people, understanding tax returns can be really confusing. It almost feels like you're reading Chinese, especially when it comes to identifying special or potential deductions that can save people money, right? If we don't know how to read a tax return, then how do we know how to analyze it and look for ways to defer, reduce, or manage our taxes? We can't. So that is why I'm bringing Sonia today. She's going to really help us break down the complexity of the tax return, make it much easier to understand and also help us understand pass-through entities in a way that we can better use that knowledge to be better business owners. And the reason we're going to talk about business tax returns as well is because the Latino community, special Latinas, are the fastest growing business owners in the nation. And so we want to make sure we are supporting our people. So with that said, here's what we're going to cover. We're going to cover, we're going to use a sample tax return to break down the different areas that you should be familiar with and understand. We're also going to cover how profits from a business flow through your personal tax return. And then we're also going to cover some common missed opportunities so you can save money in the future. With that said, Sonia, welcome. Thank you for being here. Thank you so much, Nessa, for having me on. I'm really excited to be sharing everyone how taxes works because I know that right now we're in the middle of the season and a lot of people are getting their taxes done, but I'm pretty sure they're not aware what exactly is on their return and what kind of numbers are being reported to the IRS as well as to states for those who are filing state returns as well. So I'm here to break it down jargon free so that you guys can better understand your return and make sure that you stay proactive and also take advantage of the tax code that wealthy Americans are doing to grow their financial portfolio as well. Yes, I love that. Sonia, before we get started, tell us a little bit more about how you got to do what you're doing right now. Oh yeah, of course. So as many of you guys who are new, my name is Sonia and I'm a first gen Latinx tax professional located in Connecticut. And for those who are not familiar with that state, that's actually right next door to New York in the East Coast areas. I have over eight years of corporate experience with a main focus on data analytics. So it was pretty an easy transition for me becoming very comfortable with large data to able to transition off to where I am now. Uh, before I let you guys know what I do about that, I also help the BIPOC community, similar to Nestor, gain financial confidence and also help them minimize their taxes by incorporating the tax strategies to keep more money in their pockets and expand their financial portfolio. So before I became a tax professional, back around 2019, I decided that it was really time for, to set myself straight by taking back control of my finances because after brewing up, I believe between 25 to 30K in credit card debt, I knew that I needed to work that out because I knew that I had a really bad spending habit and I was trying to live a luxury lifestyle, you can say, by just traveling and buying the latest fashion trends. And at the same time, I was struggling to pay my own rent and my utilities on time. And it got so bad that I had to ask my younger sister for some money, which really hurt my pride because I'm the oldest in my family. Yeah. So that struck me. And I knew it was really time to get my together. I started my debt-free journey. I self-taught myself how to budget, 
started building my own sinking funds to reach my financial goal. And while doing so, I was able to teach others to do the same so they don't make the same mistake that I was doing, especially because I was in my early 20s trying to live it up, not realizing how much of an impact I was doing financially. But yeah. you know, along the way, though, during my journey, I actually came across an opportunity to become a licensed tax professional. Now, since I was already feeling pretty confident by then about the basics of my own finances, as well as others, I really wanted to learn more about the taxes and the function behind it. And boy, <laughs> was I really blown away when I was exposed to the tax world because it all started to make sense when I started to see how the wealthy Americans were able to like utilize the tax goal to their advantage to reduce their taxable income while building their financial portfolio through businesses, real estate, and investments. And this was an eye-opener because <laughs> if they can benefit from this, so can my community, our community. So here I am three and a half years later, I am not only just teaching finances, but I'm also now teaching BIPOC community to utilize the same strategies as the wealthy so that they can implement it and become financially successful as well. I love that, Sonia. That's such a great journey that you took. I could imagine how hurt your pride was when you had to accept that you weren't doing well, that you needed to do something different, and especially, you know, having to ask for help from your little sister. And that brings up something that, you know, although our community, our Latina, Latino community is thriving and is starting to open up businesses, we are still one of the biggest spend spenders when you look at cultural, different cultures. And so there's still a lot of work to do there. But I think it is important to understand how to create wealth and, and how to how to use taxes to that advantage. So tell us a little bit more about taxes in a nutshell. Sure. So just to make this very short and simple, you guys, the taxes that we are paying, they're being contributed to our federal government as well as the state that you live in. And those are used, utilized to pay for the essentials that we need as a, as a whole in society, which is public transportation, public assistance, public schools, law enforcement, and emergency services. And without that, we'd probably be in a mess right now. And I will be very honest, I have utilized public transportation. I went to a public school. I, my family had used public assistance, and it really did help us. I know a lot of people have a few things to say regarding to that, but without those um, opportunities that I had, especially at, at a young age and coming from a family who, they don't have anything relating to finance. They were not educated on that. So I was very grateful for that, to have those opportunities because it was able to actually give me a boost up and look where I am now oh, without those necessities that I needed. I wouldn't be here yeah. right now. I wouldn't yeah. be here teaching you guys. I wouldn't <laughs> be here having to speak about taxes. <laughs> Exactly. No, I love that. Let's get into the meat and potatoes. Walk us through the 1040. 1040, by the way, for Rosie, who's here listening live and everyone else will be listening to this afterwards. 1040 is the most popular tax return. There's a 1040 for seniors, which looks a little different than the regular 1040. So walk us through the 1040, Sonia. Yes. So I'm going to actually go ahead and give you guys a visual outlook of what a of what 1040 is. And I'm pretty sure you guys already know, but I definitely wanted to actually break down the lines so that you guys are able to follow through it and try to also do the math on your end to see how your tax situation was going in that particular year. Yes. And by the way, we'll go ahead and post a copy of this hypothetical tax return on greencarsgreenbacks.com. So you make sure that you come back to the website and look at an archives so you can find this awesome resource. All right, Sonia, back to you. So this is the latest 2022 1040 individual return. Mostly all taxpayers filed this, including senior citizens. And basically what this shows to the IRS on the federal side is what your tax situation was in that particular year. And they're actually waiting on us to file that information, report it back to them, and letting them know that this is the information that we got in terms of income in terms of our business activity, real estate activity, as well as any securities, if you have sold off any, that will also be reflected on this 1040. And they're basically just having us do the homework, 
submit it to them. They cross check it, make sure that the information they have on there and as well matches with what you have entered on the 1040. Breaking down here, you have your basic information here, your first and last name, your social, your address. And then when you scroll down, it's going to ask like the deduction based on your filing status and if you have any dependents. So in this case, this example that I'm showing is actually head of household. And this particular taxpayer had two children that she's claiming, and they're both under the age of 18. So I entered in the child's information and based on their, the information that I entered in, there is, they also qualify for the child tax credit, which I'll get into it later on. But right here in this section, there is the income section on the 1040 which is from line 1A to line 15. Okay, perfect. So let me stop you there for a second, if I may. For those who are listening in, the top portion of the 1040 is really personal information, your name, the name of your dependents, you're telling the IRS if you're married or not. But Sonia said something that, that I want to make sure you guys understand is that they will cross-reference, the IRS will cross-reference what you're putting in here. So, you know, if you have savings accounts, and if you have investments, those companies are sending a copy of the 1099 or a copy of the tax form that they issue you. They're sending that to the IRS. They have a copy of that. So be careful when trying to make up numbers. So now what she's done is she's actually moved down a little bit. And now we're getting to the income section of the 1040. Sonia, back to you. Yes, thank you. So as Nestor mentioned, between lines one to line eight, that is where you're going to enter in the income that you have received in that year. For example, W-2s. If you have a job that issues out W-2s, you're going to enter in that information. 1099s, regardless if it's for independent contract or freelance securities that you may have sold off, any bank interest or dividends that you've received in that year, that will need to be entered in between line one to line eight. And over here, once we gather in all of those ordinary incomes, because those are taxable incomes, that will be then added based on the information that you have received. So again, for example, this particular taxpayer had a W-2, so I entered in the W-2 amount, which in this case, she have earned 8700 And then she also received a, she actually took a distribution from her retirement plan. So that falls under line 5B, which is where we enter in the distribution amount. And just keep in mind that when you take off distribution from your retirement account or a pension account, that is unfortunately taxable. And that will need to be added in and reflected on your 1040. So in this case, this particular taxpayer took a distribution of $947. I plugged that in into that particular line portion. And then she also has a business. So in this business will be reflected in this case, line eight, which is other income. And that, again, that will be, again, your business or even real estate if you made any profits on the real estate. And that in total that she received profit-wise, because this is reflecting profit-wise, she earned, her net profit for the business was 21870 So in line nine, that is where the total income is. So that's going to calculate what you have earned in that year. And in this case, this particular client, based on the three activities that she received, again, reiterating W-2, a distribution from the retirement account, and then her business income or business net profit, she received in total $31,517. Now, from line 10 to 14 are your deductions. And the deduction is very important because what we're trying to do is utilize those deductions to reduce your taxable income because that, which I will, I'll get into in a bit, is what going to reflect your income tax. In this case, from line 10, she received a deduction of 1,545. Now that is reflecting half of the self-employment tax. So because she made a net profit on the business, she is subject to both self-employment taxes. However, half of that is a tax deduction and that's applied on the first page of the income section. So in this case, her deduction was 1,545. Subtracting that again from the total income from line nine, her AGI or adjusted gross income results to be $29,972. That's just the adjustment. 
Now, this is where your other deductions kick in based on your filing status. In this case, on line 12, again, head of household. So the standard deduction in this case for head of household is 19,400. Plus, she qualified for a qualified business income or QBI of 2,114 because she made a net profit on the business. So a lot of business owners do not know that if you make a, a profit, you are also qualified for another deduction for having a net profit in the business. So in this case, this particular taxpayer qualified for 2,114. So now her total deductions after her AGI comes out to be 21,514. And just to remind you guys, her AGI was 29,972. So when you subtract those two numbers, that's going to result your taxable income because of the deductions. So in this case, 29,972 minus 21,514, her taxable income is 8,458. That is where they're going to tax you at. They're not going to tax you at your gross income or your adjusted gross income. They're going to tax you after your deductions kick in. So moving on to the second portion of the 1040 is the tax tax and credit. So now, as I mentioned before, her taxable income was 8,458. Her income tax bill for that $8,000 is $848. That's her income tax. Now, it gets funneled down. And just for you guys who are trying to follow through, the income tax will be reflected on line 16. And that gets funneled down to line 23. She didn't have any other taxes applied just be besides the income tax. But on line 23, though, she did have, she was subject to pay self-employment tax because she made a profit on the business. So in this case, her self-employment tax on her net profit was 3,185. So combining, yeah, combining those two, her total tax based on her income tax and the self-employment tax results in 3,185. Now, the next pay, next section will be the payment, which is line 25 to 33. Those are your payments that you made either through your employers or if you pay taxes when you took out a distribution from a retirement account. And on top of that, any other tax credits that you may be eligible for. So in this case, this particular taxpayer had a few activities going on. So in line 25, will reflect the tax payments that you made through your employer, through your, if you took in, again, a distribution, or if you made any other tax payments. So in this case, line 25, line 25A, W2 will show the payments that she made through her employer, which is 282. Then she paid taxes on the distribution, which is $109. So, so far she paid in total pre prepayments, 472. She qualified for two types of tax credit, which is the earned income credit and then the child tax credit. So the earned income credit is only applicable to those who have hit a income threshold. It's geared more towards to lower income families. So she was able to qualify for this particular tax credit. And on top of that, she had two children, which is $1,500 each. So in this case, in total, her tax, her child tax credit was $3,000. So her total payments, her payments through her employer's distribution, as well as the tax credit, she has $7,091. So her total payments that she had on line 32 will show total other payments and refundable credit. So again, that's the $4,900. 4,091 through the child tax credit and then 3,000. So that was 7,900, 7,091 plus the 472 through her W-2 and her 1099. Her total payments was 7,563. Now, because her tax bill was 3,185 and she had a total payment of 7,563, subtracting those two, which will go into the next section, which is the refund section, shows what her refund amount is because she overpaid. Again, her income tax was 3,185. She had total payments of 7,563. So on line 34, 
will show the refund amount or the difference that she will get back, which in this case was $4,378. That's how taxes work. So any overpayments that you made plus your tax credits will get subtracted from the income tax. And usually that will result in a refund. And that usually shows that you, you overpaid the government and they're just refunding you back the difference that you owe. And okay. a lot of people have this con a conception like, oh my goodness, I got a big refund. Great. But the thing is that there's a likelihood that you had a refund because you overpaid either through your employer or because you have qualified credits, credits. because of your children. Yeah. And this is where people tend to compare themselves saying, oh, like my uncle, me, my <laughs> sister, they got big refunds. Why did I? And I'm like, it really depends on your tax situation. And most of the time, these are single filers who don't have any dependents. They don't qualify for much. They don't qualify for any credits, to be yeah. honest. Yeah, you don't so, have any of those refundable credits. It's, you're giving the government a free loan if you're getting a big return at the end of the year. That's where talking to people like Sonia to help you plan and forecast for the future well, maybe give, put a little more cash in your pocket throughout the year, which is really important. Sonia, I do want to go back up to the income section of the 1040, because I, I want to thank you for kind of giving us a, a rundown of the tax return. But I think we should take some time to really help people understand some opportunities for planning in a tax way. So we talked about the income section of the 1040 being from line one to line eight. That's basically where you're telling the government all the different income sources that are coming in. And as a financial advisor, one of the things that I want to make sure is that I'm reducing taxable income for my clients when they don't need it. So for an example, let's say that you have investments outside of a retirement account. You have to be careful with what type of investments you're placing in those accounts because those accounts spit out income on a yearly basis. And there are investments like mutual funds, which sometimes will spit out capital gains or dividends or income that go on to section one of your tax return. And even though they're hitting your tax return and you're paying taxes on it, maybe you're not using that income right now. So I call it phantom income. You're basically creating a taxable bill for you that you don't need. So maybe it's better to place that particular investment in a tax deferred account, like a traditional IRA, like a traditional 401k, even a Roth IRA as well. Now, she also talked about IRA, dis IRA distributions being part of this income section. And that's where when, we, when I'm working with clients and helping them build a savings plan, we also want to make sure we're using a tax diversified plan because as we get older, we naturally are going to have to replace that W-2 income or business income via our investments. And if we have accounts that we can tap to get cash but don't have to go on our tax return, don't have to show us income, then we essentially are giving us our, we're giving us ourselves the ability to impact that ultimate taxable income number that it all boils down to. So really being, be, being careful in where, what type of investments you place in which account, and also understanding that different accounts have different taxation rules is really important as you're creating your wealth. Another thing that I wanted to talk about here is W-2 W two income. When I talk to clients, they'll, they'll look at your tax return and say, here's how much I made. Well, that might not be 100% accurate because that total amount from your W-2 that's coming in, Sonia, correct me if I'm wrong, is after the 401k contributions you put in. So essentially, you probably you, there, there's a high possibility that you actually made more than what you see in line 1A from work because that's the whole thing. You're deferring, you're using accounts that basically take the income off of the tax return. So that's kind of my two cents on the income section of the tax return. Sonia, do you got it? Do you have anything else? Oh, no, you actually nailed this down. So I do appreciate you mentioning this and making it very clear because a lot of people do get very confused when they're looking at this particular income section because I know there is a lot of lines, but this is where I try to let clients know because they always question like, well, why is it that my income tax is at this amount likely based on the activity that you had going on in that particular year. You had your W-2, you had your business income, 
you had dividends, you had interest, you took a distribution, you sold some securities, like that gets all added up there, which is, and unfortunately, we're going to have to report that because that information that you received, those documents, they already got furnished to the IRS and they're waiting for you to report it. And I have seen cases where they do not, they try to be very smart and not enter in a particular tax form, but I will say this, the IRS knows what you're doing. They have that information. And what's going to happen is that when they actually do a thorough review on their return, if they see a mismatch on the tax return, they're going to issue you, if not at the end of the year, early in the following year, a CP2000 notice, notifying you that they have found that you failed to report a particular tax form. They went ahead and made the adjustments on their end And because of that adjustment, that is likely going to cost you because now that they entered in that income, your taxable income increase, which would then result in an increase on the income tax, which can lead to you paying the difference on that income tax. And on top of that, when they do issue you a notice with a proposal of this is your new tax bill, they do add in the penalties and interest for not reporting that information. So Please don't try to (laughs) be very slick with that. Even if you think it's a small amount, that to them is not a, they see this as if you were trying to not disclose an information and that could potentially lead to an audit in the future. And you do not want to open up that can of worms. But there, as Nestor say, if you really want to lower your taxable income, there are opportunities, there are strategies that we can implement by, again, as you mentioned, defer accounts where let's go ahead and maybe let's try to contribute more to our 401 or let's have you apply for an HSA if you have already a high premium insurance. Any Anything that what we can do to help you not pay a significant amount in taxes, there, yeah. there are strategies that we can implement. It's just really up to you to do it as tax yeah. pay- Exactly, exactly. You're the tax advisor. The individuals are ultimately the taxpayers and they're the tax deciders. So definitely important for individuals to consult a tax advisor when they're trying to make any major moves. Also, when you're trying to maybe withdraw money from accounts, it's really important to work with your financial advisor and your tax advisor to figure out what is the best way of mixing all these different income sources to ultimately reduce your tax bill. You know, I, I think Sonia, you and I can sit here and geek about this stuff for a really long time and talk, but I also know that our listeners have a short period of time and they also want to uh, make sure that we leave them with the most value. So let's talk about pass through you know, profit, profit and losses from business. Yeah. Yes. So I want to briefly go over this because I know for a lot of business owners, this is going to be very vital, especially if you are going to eventually apply for a credit line or a business loan. They are going to request prior your tax return and they want to see what your business activity was in those particular years, primarily like the past three years. So I really wanted to break this down for my business owners out there to see what information that they should be looking out for, especially if they're already in the process of getting this done with their tax preparer. So in this particular case, for those who are sole proprietors, single members, or C members, freelancers, partnerships, just know that stuff gets reported on your 1040 return. And in this particular case, the Schedule C that needs to be submitted along with your individual. It cannot be submitted separately. And because it is considered the activity, the business activity is considered a pass-through entity. So what that means is a pass-through entity is like all the income comes through the owner or through the taxpayer, all the income that you receive. And that gets funneled into the 1040 after you complete in the backend information. So in this case, for the Schedule C for business owners, you guys are going to enter in your basic information, the name of the business, the name of the proprietor, the business address. And then there's actually three parts of the Schedule C, five, actually five. There's five parts of the Schedule C. So part one is the income section. And that is where you're going to enter in your gross receipts or sell based on your p l based on the 1099s NEC that you receive for independent work and also the 1099Ks from the third-party processors. And again, you have to enter in 
and report that information on your tax return because that's already been furnished to the IRS. So in this case, this particular taxpayer, her gross receipt from like the three sources that she had gotten, which was 1099s, NACs, and then the 1099 case combined, she made a, a sales of 25,984. She didn't have any returns. She did not sell any, did not sell any gold, good sold. She's actually a service-based business, so she didn't have any inventory. Luckily, she didn't have any refunds either. So in this case, this all gets money into the gross income. And now in part two is actually the layer of the categories of expenses that you have relating to your business activity. So like you're going to see in part two, like advertising, car expenses, commission fees, contract labor, depreciation, employee benefit groups, insurance, interest, legal professional service office expenses, any supplies or any other tax or taxes or license that you had to pay travels and meals, you name it. So in this particular section for this taxpayer, she had minimal expenses, which is good because that just shows that she was able to do very well in her business because she didn't have to spend too much. So the only thing she had spent was on advertising, legal professional and service. And then she also had under- well, be other Before you move forward, Sonia, I think this is the really important part is you have to come up with this line items at the end of the year. So someone's got to be doing the bookkeeping. You don't want to find yourself at the end of the year trying to guess how much you spent in advertising or how much you spent in travel. You want to make sure that is happening throughout the year. So when you go to do your tax return, and like Sonia says, you have to do the P&L that it's there and you're not having to you know, make things up. Yes. And I want to also mention that without that P and now me personally, I cannot take on a client without that information, but because the thing is that the IRS are definitely targeting a lot of small business owners when it comes to the audits. And the reason is because they know a lot of business owners don't have good record keeping systems. So I always encourage and train my clients to have that P and L ready. If you don't go through the booking bookkeeping through me, I really do recommend that you go with, with someone else or do it through the QuickBooks or Zero software. It's an, a cheaper alternative, but you have to be very consistent. You have to reconcile and double check your transactions and that they're categorized correctly. Because if you don't have that information and you get audited in the future and you don't have that, oh, let's believe that they will take away any of these deductions that you try to write off on your tax return, they're going to remove that. And that is going to result you in a bigger tax bill. And yes. you don't want that. So thank you for bringing that up. Yeah. So yeah. So for those who are curious, how did I get this information for this particular taxpayer? She has her own bookkeeper. She had that PL ready for me. So I was able to enter in the information accordingly. So yeah, so this is what I have plugged in and on line 28, would show like the total expenses. So in this case, she had 4,114. So her net profit was 21,870. She did not have any other home expenses. So, and that's usually reflected on line 30. Um, but in this case, she didn't have any home expenses. And I, that was pretty much it. Her net profit was 21,870. And that is where the self-employment tax would kick in. And so in this case, as I mentioned in the very beginning, because she made a profit, she is subject to pay the self-employment taxes. And that was actually added on top of the 1040. But luckily, she has some credits that she was able to actually pay off that self-employment tax with ease. But for those who don't have any dependents or any other credits to qualify, this is where you have to plan ahead, do your quarterly payments. But in order to figure out what your quarterly payments are for federal and for state, you have to have proper bookkeeping. Your preparer, like myself, we for me, I usually do an analysis just to see where you're pacing out and what your potential estimated tax payment will be so that we can make those payments accordingly. Because that is something that we need to do. You do not want to wait until the end of the year or even the following year when you're filing your tax return. <laughs> you didn't make any payments and it's going to result you in a big bill. And on top of that, because you underpay, you're going to have to pay penalties and interest for underpay. That's right. That's right. That's right. You don't want to give any more money to the government. <laughs> as it is. Yeah. So make sure and you have all of that. Exactly. And it's not that difficult to really be able to forecast this stuff. There's even a simple formula to be able to figure out what you're, what you, what the minimum tax you have to pay the following year to stay out of trouble is. And so this is where the flow through income comes in is like, 
all of this income from your business will flow back to your 1040, as we talked about earlier, and then your taxable income is, is obviously computed and decided. That's awesome. So let's talk about tax tips, Sonia. Tax tips for 2023 and onwards. Oh, yes. Okay. As I mentioned, tax tips, we definitely want to make sure that you have the proper bookkeeping. If you don't have proper bookkeeping, get to it right away, especially for this year. We're so early on. You want to make sure that you are categorizing your transaction accordingly, reconciling your books monthly, if not on a quarterly basis. Consider adding tax planning because, again, as I mentioned, tax planning is an analysis of your current tax situation, and it gives us an idea of where you're pacing at in terms of your income and what your potential tax payment should be when we make those payments. And this will also help us, at least when I when clients come to me for this particular portion, is that we're trying to look for a, try to implement strategies to reduce that taxable income. Or in this case, if they have other income, for example, like the W-2, then this allows us to make any withholding with adjustment on the W-4. So that way they make the necessary changes so that they're not underpaying and we can avoid a tax bill shock because I seen a lot of faces this year when they see that bill and they're saying, I thought paid enough, like you did not pay enough, especially yeah. when you have so many income activity from other areas, as I mentioned real estate, investments, businesses, your W-2 job, they all add up. Yes, absolutely. Any other tips, Sonia? Let's see. Oh, please, when it comes to your bookkeeping too, because I think this is, I really want to call this out. I know a lot of business owners ask me like, how do I pay myself and how do I label that on my book? So I want to mention that if you're a sole proprietor or LLC, or partnership, again, I mentioned those, or yeah, those are treated as pass-through entity. And the thing is that that particular income that you receive, you're being, you're taxed on the total business profit. So a lot of, a lot of people saying, well, I need to pay myself though. So that's wage. No, unfortunately, when you're taking money out of your business, that's considered an owner's draw. And that cannot be written off as a wage on your P&L or on the Schedule C. And the reason is because the tax law does not allow owners to categorize their withdrawals as wages unless they file an S or C corp tax entity. Once you file that particular entity, then you are allowed to pay yourself and label that as wage, which is a whole different scenario. Yeah, we can really talk about that. I think one of my biggest concerns is that our Latino community is very entrepreneur, entrepreneur, but we also know that small businesses fail at a high rate. And my concern is that people don't understand how to, like you said, how much do I pay myself? What is the difference between me paying myself a salary versus taking a withdrawal, a distribution for my business? When should I take a distribution versus pay myself? And then some people get really, once they realize that, hey, like distributions are not subject to FICA taxes, which is Social Security, Medicare, then they're like, oh, I'm just going to take income from the business via distribution and I'm going I'm to pay myself very little. But you got to be careful with that because the IRS is that you have to pay yourself a reasonable wage. And reasonable, obviously there's some black and gray there, but that's another trigger. That's another trigger to being audited. And that that's basically fraud is what you're committing. You're committing fraud by trying not to pay Medicare, Social Security taxes, which is silly because you're going to want those Social Security payments down the road. Anyhow, like I think that is definitely another conversation of how do we, how should we pay ourselves? How much? How does that all work? And I'd, I'd love to maybe maybe do another episode like that with you, girl, because you, you see it. Oh, I um, see that a lot. I've been yeah. saying it to this day and I'm like, we get, and I will say this, if you guys make mistakes on your tax terms too, it's okay because these are fixable as long as you make those changes before the IRS catches it. Because once they catch it, they're coming, uh, they're coming hot. They're, they're coming, coming hot. hot bro. But uh, please, that's another tip too. Be proactive too. If you know you made a mistake and you really want to do it right by just making those changes, please do so right away. That's yeah. why it is there for. Exactly. <laughs> you know, an opportunity to do things right. So think about it, you guys. So yeah, a question from Rosie who had to leave for a meeting. When is it convenient to file as head of household instead of married filed, married filing joint? 
Okay, that's a really good question. So the only time you can file head of household is that you cannot be married, okay? Or at least not live. Um, I know in this case, it's parents who are separated. If you are not living with that spouse anymore, then you can then or take that filing status of head of household. But legally, if you are Mary, and you are living with that individual, you are not allowed to take that status. You will unfortunately will have to take either the Mary filing jointly or Mary firing me separately. And I've seen a lot of mistakes with that too, <laughs> where there you got some couples here who are trying to take advantage of the head of household status because of the standard deduction. It is significantly higher than single filers and Mary filing jointly too, right? or separately. Yeah. Because it's in this case, it's twelve thousand nine hundred fifty for single filers, while head of household, as you saw, was fifteen thousand four hundred, and that is a lot of people use that because that's trying to reduce their taxable income because it's a higher deduction. So, I definitely recommend that you guys talk to your tax preparer and see if you are in a situation that where you're no longer with your partner. See if you are eligible for that head of household, but if again, they will have to run the rules. They have to follow the rules that's laid out yeah. for when yeah. it comes to the head of house. And it, I will say that is like a highly abused filing status as well. <laughs> so we, they are asking a lot more paperwork from us preparers. They're now asking us to do our due diligence by making sure we have the children's information, any proof that they were able, they were taking care of the child and the child was living with them and that they were the only household member in that particular residency when they filed their tax return. Gotcha. Yeah. So there's definitely a lot to it. It's not like you can just choose it. You got to qualify for that type of, of filing. You you don't want to be playing that game either. <laughs> Sonia, how can people find you if they want to know more about your work with you? Yeah. So I am mostly on IG at Castellan Tax Services. I am currently taking on new clients. So feel free to shoot me a message. That's also on my IG page as well. I have a link that you can utilize to just send me a message or a DM. I am currently doing still a free 15 minute consultation call. So I will be providing that started with that link as well. If you guys are interested in scheduling a call with me and learning more about how you can work with me, we are, you guys are still early on. So if you guys are concerned, oh my goodness, it's March. I don't have, I don't know if I able to work with Sonia. No, we're still taking on new clients. If you do wait till April, that's another story. <laughs> But yes, I am mostly on there and I do provide a lot of tips, mostly for small business owners. And I recently just started ramping on TikTok. So if you guys are more into TikTok, feel free to find me there as well. I started putting more content there, which is, I'm still getting used to the vibe of TikTok. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But yeah. It's definitely different. All right. Make sure we put links to, to all of your social channels in that free strategy session you talked about in the show notes. Again, greencardstogreenbacks.com, top of the page archives, and then you can find this episode. Sonia, thank you so much for being here. I really appreciate your time. Yeah. Thank you so much, Vanessa, for having me on. Bueno pues. I hope you guys enjoyed this episode. I want to go ahead and ask you to please send me any questions you may have or any topics you want me to talk about. I'll go ahead and send them to Nestor, N-E-S-T-O-R, at greencards to greenbacks.com. I actually read every email you send, so I'd love to hear from you. Don't forget to head over to greencards to greenbacks.com for the show notes for this episode and really links to any resources we may have discussed. Bueno, amigos y amigas, nos vemos pronto. Let's go make those greenbacks.